Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dan Stringfield. I'm a patent litigation attorney with the law firm of Steptoe & Johnson. It's a large DC-based firm, but I'm here with the Chicago office. Uh, I'm very pleased and excited to present uh, what I believe will be a very interesting program this morning. Uh, let me introduce our panel. To my immediate left is my good friend Mark Strawn. Uh, Mark and I actually had a case together a few years back. Uh, he's a partner with the law firm of Sales & Wardner in Dallas, Texas, and he was counsel for Kamal USA. Next to Mark is Professor Sarab Vishnubak, who is with Texas A&M A University School of Law. And then at the end of the table is Professor Daryl Lim of John Marshall Law School. Uh, he was on brief amicus curiae of the 16 intellectual property law professors in support of the respondent. Uh, so briefly, uh, this morning's panel will be about the Supreme Court's decision in Kamal USA versus Cisco. In a six to two decision, written by Justice Kennedy, vacating the Federal Circuit's decision below, the Supreme Court held that a defendant's belief regarding patent validity is not a defense to an induced infringement claim. In the case, Cisco Systems was found to have both directly infringed and actively induced infringement of Kamal's patents for a method of implementing short-range wireless networks. On the active inducement claim, the Federal Circuit reversed the district court and held that, quote, evidence of an accused infringer's good faith belief of invalidity may negate the requisite intent for induced infringement. But the Supreme Court rejected the Federal Circuit's view. So the first question I'd like to ask the panel is, is how do you reconcile or differentiate the, the Supreme Court's prior decision in global tech uh, with, with this common decision? I guess I'll start with Mark. Well, global tech is about infringement, knowledge of infringement. Uh, our case was about knowledge of validity or invalidity. Uh, so that's the difference. And you're on my side of that argument, and you see there's a difference, and it's a real easy difference to see. If you're on the other side, uh, you shake your head like Justice Scalia and say, what difference? And so. To answer your question, how do I differentiate? That's it. It's, one's about infringement, the other's about validity, and they're different. I'm sure we'll spend the next hour talking about the differences. And these two gentlemen to my left who are both participating in the case uh, will tell you the other side. And before they open their mouth, let me tell you they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, we knew that already. Oh, of course. Uh, professor Vishnubak? Well, I can tell you the, the benefit of being a law professor is you get to relitigate cases that you've already lost. So. Um, the relationship between validity and infringement in this case um, is, well, let me first answer your question. I think this case cannot be reconciled conceptually with, uh, with global tech, and the fact that we now have both of these decisions on the books creates a, uh, an interesting uh, conflict, and I'll get to that in a moment. But the key split between the majority opinion and Justice Scalia's dissent was whether, I mean, the two issues are different, validity and infringement. The question is whether it is necessary for a patent to be valid in order for it to be infringed. Now, Judge Newman's dissent in the case uh, in the Federal Circuit, the majority opinion said it is possible to infringe an invalid patent, but liability will not follow. I think that position is wrong, and I think Justice Scalia's dissent sort of lays out uh, very clearly why. Uh, the definition of infringement in section 271A is whoever makes use, sells, you know, et cetera, uh, without author authorization. And during the term of the patent, infringes the patent. So if the patent turns out to be invalid, which is to say it turns out to have been invalid all along, then there's no valid legal basis for anyone to withhold that authorization. That's missing now from the elements of infringement. And so what has taken place somebody practicing the subject matter uh, of the invention is not infringement by definition. So it's true that the two issues are different, but I think if you are required to know that infringement is taking place, as Global Tech does, then you must first know that the patent is valid. If you don't believe the patent is valid, then you can't form the necessary scienter to infringe. And I think Justice Scalia got that right. Professor Lim? Yeah. Thanks, Dan. First of all, uh, thank you, Ed, for the invitation to be here. It's a pleasure to be with you all. So what, what is 
this all about? This is cost correction. You had Justice Kennedy being in the dissent in the global tech decision. Justice Kennedy is the author of the Comil decision. Now, did Comil deal with intent? Absolutely, absolutely. And you, the fact that you had Scalia and Roberts in the dissent in Comil, who signed on to the majority in global tech, suggests that they believed that there was a connection between the scienter that uh, uh, Sarup was talking about. Now, so what's going on here? You had Kennedy in global tech, very concerned about this idea of going into the mind of the defendant and really wanting a more objective standard. Didn't want willful blindness, wanted some kind of a more objective circumstantial test. He obviously got, got the majority of the Supreme Court in Comil to move in his direction in, uh, com in the Comil case itself. Now, so what that means is it's, it's not a clear-cut situation. I would say right from the start that this is cost correction. Watch this space because if you look at where the Federal Circuit is going with uh, Teva, where the Federal Circuit is going with Akamai, where the Federal Circuit will likely go with Kamil, it's likely to, go to do its own thing. So I concur with Saru and add that in addition to the benefit of being able to relitigate re the case, we can make fairly uh, bold predictions based on data, based on what the Federal Circuit is doing uh, with Akabai, with um, Teva, that you also would see Federal Circuit saying, well, all right, so we're not going to find this based on validity, but we're going to find that there is no inducement based on no knowledge of infringement and reach the same result. So, again, watch this space. Great. Well, I think we would all agree that the majority and the dissent <coughs> both recognize that the issues of validity and infringement are distinct issues. And so the concern, and you know, I'll, I'll put it to the panel, but it seems that the concern is, uh, you know, invalid patents being enforced. But isn't the issue of, of validity a separate and apart issue of the case that'll be tried in its own, in its own way? And so, you know, the, the, the infringement issue, which which you know the dissent would have turn, also on the issue of validity, you know, would, would be properly addressed at a different point in the litigation. So, I, I said, does anybody have any thoughts on on that? Well, I'll start with Mark. Uh, well, I think this. Is the threshold question, the statement, you can't infringe an invalid patent, I think is the conclusion. It's not the beginning point. Um, and to stress that, the majority in our case use the term liability for infringement. You cannot be liable for infringing an invalid patent. And so when we have this debate, I always want to say, wait a minute, when you state the, the premise, it has to include liability for infringement. And then I think phrasing the question that way in yours to my benefit, leaving out the word liability makes it sound um, or the other way. Um, when you start there, I think that the beginning place is to say, one, what are the claim steps or attributes of the invention? Do you practice those steps? Does your, do you embody those attributes? And if you do, in my book, that's infringement. Infringement is nothing more or less than embodying the claimed attributes or steps. But just like saying, well, we had an offer and acceptance to form a contract, that doesn't make you liable. It's the first step. And then you go through a lot of other analysis, including all the different ways that a patent may be deemed invalid. But at the beginning point, the patent is valid. I would submit the 271, uh, as Sarab described, has a, a, a presumption of validity. So there is a patent at the beginning of the process. Can you infringe an invalid patent? If you're going to say, wait a minute, that's the concept, then I say, okay, fine. But if you're going to take that position, you have to give me that the patent is valid until through process you have deemed otherwise. Go through, go through the PTO, go through the court whatever the process may be. 
expiration by time that's mentioned in 271. So an event happens whereby the patent is no longer enforceable. It is no longer valid. And my position would be until that event occurs, the patent, because of the presumption, is valid. And then the analysis must be deemed valid and respected. Uh, yeah, so I think Mark is exactly right, and it points up a tort law distinction that the court uh, certainly addressed, and I think the, uh, the dissent did a better job of analyzing not only uh, the, I mean, it, I, obviously I think the dissent uh, is, is the right outcome, but the, the analysis on this point was something that the majority opinion actually sort of fumbled a little in my view. And that tort law distinction is between knowledge and intent about actions that take place in the world and knowledge and intent about legal consequences, right? Direct infringement does not require, as I'm sure Mark would agree, it does not require you to know any legal consequences. You don't have to know that the patent exists. You don't have to know that you were committing infringement. Yeah, induced infringement does require that, but direct infringement only requires that you uh, well, it doesn't require either of those things. Now, the question is, what does it require? Certainly, it requires that you practiced all the steps of the invention. It also requires, though, that it had to have been without authorization. And I'll reiterate this point. If what you've done is embodied all the attributes of the invention, but there's no way somebody can withhold authorization from you because the patent's not valid, then what has taken place is simply not infringement. Liability will not follow, that's true, but I would say it's not even infringement. What you've done is something less. You've simply practiced the invention. Now, the district or the, the Supreme Court in this case took the government's recommendation and did something that it's never done before in a patent case. It said patent infringement, direct infringement, is a strict liability tort. And I think that's wrong. And it's Something that sort of patent lawyers think is rote, direct infringement. Of course, it's a strict liability tort, right? The reason we think it's a strict liability tort, and if you trace the, the footnotes back, the court in Kamel uh, and the government's brief cited to footnote two in the slip opinion of Global Tech, which said infringement requires direct infringement, requires no more than the unauthorized use of the invention. And for that, it cited Aero Manufacturing from 1964 and the 1937 edition of Deller's Walker on Patents, both of those sources only say that it's not uh, anything more than the unauthorized use of the invention. For example, you don't need to know the patent exists, and you don't need to know that you committed infringement. What's missing? What about knowledge about the action? Did you commit the action? Because that's what tort law asks you. That's what tortious intent is. If you knew you were committing the action, that's an intentional tort. If you didn't know you were committing the action and are still liable, that's strict liability. And that's not what the direct infringement standard is. Right? So by conflating this distinction between are you knowledgeable or acting with intent with respect to the action, that's the induced action here, versus did you know that the patent existed? Did you know the induced acts constitute infringement? As global tech requires, those are two different issues. And by con collapsing them, uh, the, the Supreme Court's majority opinion here actually imported the direct infringement standard into the induced infringement standard. And the, the result, uh, the practical implication of this, is a particularly incoherent outcome. If you think that a patent is valid and you merely have a good faith belief that the actions that you induced uh, did not infringe it, then you're in the clear. Right? That's global tech. But if you think that a patent is invalid and impossible to infringe, you may still be on the hook. That's what the common majority holds. So we're in this sort of nonsensical position of having to accommodate some patents that are believed in good faith to be invalid, but to accommodate less patents that are believed to be valid and merely uninfringed. Thank you, Professor. Before uh, uh, Professor Lim uh, also responds, and I'd like to hear his response, Something jumped out at me in, in, in your response where you said the, the accused infringer would be on the hook. Might still be on the hook. Might still be on the hook. Yeah. But, you know, again, the issue of validity is still part of the case. And you, you, know, you would be eventually found not to. If, you're only in trouble if you're wrong, I guess is what I'm saying. If, yeah. if, you have a, if you have a good faith belief that you don't infringe, 
you know, under this decision, mm -hmm. you may still be an indirect infringer. You may still be a, a reduced infringer. That's true, but the, the fear about undermining the presumption of validity is what I'm getting at with the direct infringement analysis, right? Because it's not that it would undermine the presumption of validity if a good faith belief of invalidity were a defense to direct infringement. That's not the case here. All that's necessary is for the patent actually to be valid. You don't need to know or believe that the patent is valid in order to be a direct infringer. But if you are going to be required to know that you were infringing or, or that the, the acts you induced were infringing, which Global Tech does require, then you must first know that the patent was valid. You must have a good faith belief. Because if that's not the case, then the direct infringer, so far as you're concerned, is incapable of infringing the patent. So you can't form that necessary. Professor Lin? Yeah, I think Saurabh really touches on the nub of the issue, which is the distinction between direct infringement and indirect uh, liability. And that's a point that I and my colleagues uh, in, in the brief that was authored by Professor Tim Holbrook tried to impress on the court. Uh, we got two justices to heed us. But it was also a point that I think was on the top of the minds of uh, Judge Prost, Chief Judge Prost, as well as Judge O'Malley mm -hmm. down below, as well as the judges on the en banc panel who denied that rehearing. So I think they were all cognizant of the fact that with indirect infringement, with inducement in particular, you need this element of culpability. And what that means is you make a situation which is otherwise unadministrable, untenable for a company that produces millions of devices to have to police the use, sale, making of those devices and make it more manageable by saying, well, all right, if you do your due diligence, if you in good faith believe that it is not infringed or invalid, then you enter the market, you sell your device, and if you're challenged, then you will be prepared to show before the judge and the jury that you have had that good faith belief. The burden is still on you to show it, but you have the opportunity to show it, and we believe that both as a matter of law and a matter of policy, it's important to give defendants that chance. Why as a matter of law? If you look at Grokster, if you look at uh, Global Tech, if you look even at copyright cases like Fonovisa, uh, Fonovisa you see time and again this element of an active participation, a financial benefit, some kind of a bad faith element in that conduct. With Cisco, Cisco did its due diligence. It entered the market. It failed, obviously, because if it succeeded, we wouldn't be here today, a point that was touched on just a few moments ago. But what happens if you do all that and go into the market and you're sued? If you are li liable in directly, well, I think there's nothing to be said about intent. Intent is irrelevant. You just look at the elements of the claim. But if you are, in addition to being liable directly, which Cisco was to the tune of $3.7 million, and you want to add on to that inducement liability, then you need to be cognizant of what the policy implications of that are for businesses going forward. Every time they receive a letter, they've got to stop their production and say, well, do we challenge the patent at the PTO? Do we challenge the patent at the courts before we proceed? Otherwise, what's going to happen uh, both to us as well as to our customers? Now, as a matter of practice, most large companies like Cisco and Apple, they have got indemnity and indemnification anyway. So it's not like we have a situation where the plaintiff, the patentee, goes without a remedy. The patentee will have a remedy. But how broadly do you want to construe this element of uh, of inducement in order to make sure that the patentee not only gets the cherry and eats it, but also gets to charge the, uh, the defendant for it twice over. Well, Professor Lim, um, can, I, can I answer that? Yeah, yeah. please, <laughs> please. Uh, I don't know where it's a good part to put in a plug, but let me do it right here. You, you heard Sarah kind of talk about this whole question of strict liability and he's got I don't has it been published yet or is it a, is it pending it's forthcoming. it's forthcoming there's an excellent thought-provoking law review article that rob has got coming out that I commend to your consideration I found it obviously and having been published so you can find it out there thought-provoking I don't know that I agree with everything in there but it sure makes you think about things that we took for granted uh, 
we just kind of fly by this strict liability for 271A and then move on. Maybe we shouldn't, or maybe we should, but why? And so I, I commend that with you to you to consider because he's not going to tell you about it. Uh, but I think that, that Daryl's statements really highlight the different perspectives about induced infringement. And Justice Scalia, I think, expressed in the argument the concepts that, that Daryl just described, and that is, isn't inducement kind of supplemental liability, supplemental recovery, because the real cherry is the direct infringer. And so, you know, shouldn't to kind of get the extra benefit. I don't know what you say that goes with the, the tart or the sugar, but whatever goes with the cherry, shouldn't, <laughs> shouldn't you have to do more to get the extra helping? That's one perspective. And if you have that perspective that, well, it's a supplement to the main, main focus, then a lot of this becomes very easy to embrace Scalia's position of, of well, wait a minute. It should be more. It shouldn't be that easy. On the other hand, the position for, I believe, certainly for us, and I think the majority is that what's happening is direct infringers in method claims typically partners because in the, in the, the accused product in this case, only it's a method claims and it only infringes when you turn a switch on. Sitting in a box, it doesn't infringe. So until either the manufacturer turns it on to test it or he sells it, someone buys it, and they plug it in and turn it on, there's no infringement. Now, by the way, when you turn it on, it infringes. There's not an ultra, I mean, it infringes by default when it's turned on. So this isn't the issue where, wait a minute, somebody buys something and uses it in a way that the manufacturer didn't know, didn't intend, kind of this parade of horribles. Wait a minute, these people didn't even think about that. If you turn it on by default, it's going to do exactly what the claim requires. Now, the problem from our perspective is this. You've got someone any of you, maybe this campus who buys these devices and spreads them out, no clue about our patent, no clue about the claims, no clue about any of them. You practice each of those when you turn a switch on, you're, on, you're liable. Strict liability or whatever term you want to use. Cisco or the other manufacturer of the device who knows about the patent, who got claim charts, who knows exactly <coughs> what's at, at, at uh, it value here sells that, knowing all that. And yet, they're really, as we said, the mastermind. And there's a higher burden. And from our perspective, if you see that, then that seems to be backward. Shouldn't the innocent purchaser consumer, shouldn't the bar be higher to go after them? Because they didn't make it. And they're more likely, less likely to know about it. And the manufacturer who does know, or more likely to know, and can cut off the problem earlier, isn't that the one who should be the cherry and the consumers the extra helping of ice cream? So I think that kind of perspective that there's a reason for contributory and induced indirect liability for infringement that stands alone. If you embrace that view, then I think you find Comil versus Cisco easier to say, I get that. If you take the other view that, wait a minute, it's supplemental, then you will find the decision very distasteful. So again, it's, it's just it's perspectives, I think. Well, I'm getting hungry with all the <laughs> right now. Right <clears throat> so, and I'll ask the professors, because I, I'll say as a trial lawyer, and I think Mark will agree with me, that we don't want an induced infringement case. I think we, you know, I'd take it to direct infringement case any day of the week. So professors, are, are we really concerned that the floodgates for induced infringement are open now? Where there's going to, you know, that now that the, you know, it could be theoretically uh, easier to pursue. Is that a concern or is that something you guys have considered? I don't think it's that the floodgates are opened by this case because Mark is exactly right. There's very little incentive economically, like law aside, there's very little incentive to go after a single direct infringer who's an end consumer and it's going to cost more to draft the, the first page of the complaint than it is to get all the damages you're ever going to get out of this person. What you want is the least cost avoider and the deep pockets, right? That's who's in the best position to remedy the infringement uh, monetarily. And it's also the person in the best position, because they know the most, to avoid infringement in the first place. So as a matter of economic efficiency, I think it's absolutely right that the inducer is the one that 
one would want to go after in order both to r right the situation, right the wrong, and uh, and make sure that uh, you know, these kinds of infringements don't happen again in the future. Now, I don't think that should happen at the expense of conceptual clarity in the law, because then we're not going to be fighting about whether people's rights are being violated, but we're going to be fighting about whether the doctrine gives us enough play to you know, engage in strategic behavior and gamesmanship, these sorts of things. But the economic incentive to go after the person in the inducer's position was always there. And I think at the margin, this might make it a little easier to, to get recovery from them. But I don't think it's going to create a wave of new litigation uh, because that incentive is really Professor Lin? Yeah, that's a great question. So three points. One, I think as a practical matter, if you are a company like Cisco or Apple, like I said, if you have all these potentially innocent infringers facing multi-million dollar lawsuits, you are going to want to make sure that they are going to be OK. Otherwise, nobody's going to do business with you. So there's going to be a market incentive in, for the inducer to shield the uh, di direct infringer from liability, if at all possible. Now, of course, if the direct infringer is itself uh, some kind of a, a bad agent, that brings us outside <coughs> of the situation, which I'm not talking about. Now, secondly, for all intents and purposes, it's infringement and validity are considered in the same trial. So it's not like we have, the court has to consider uh, a whole lot of other evidence. So this argument that is going to increase the burden on courts, on juries, so on, I think it's a, it's a spurious one and one that is uh, thrown out there to amplify the problem more than it is. Third, and this answers your question directly, are there going to be more claims? I don't think so. But what you will see, and this is where the law of unintended consequences comes in. If I were an inducer, and I know that I'm not going to get away with the validity defense now, every time I see a potential claim, a potential pattern that's going to be problematic, I'm going to go to the patent office. I'm going to go to the district courts and invalidate that pattern just to be safe. Now, what that means is the patentees may get more than they bargained for. Rather than just having one situation where you have a defendant that says, all right, sorry, I didn't know that this didn't work. I'm going to be liable going forward for damages and injunctions, but not before. Now you're going to have a situation that the patentee can't bring a claim against anyone else because, as I think we'll be talking about, about 40% of patents that are litigated are found to be invalid. So from the patentee's point of view, it's actually worse off for them post-commit, I think, than pre-commit. Mm -hmm. Mark, or is the plaintiff's bar ramping up on its own? <laughs> <laughs> e even before the, our case, uh, we were, you know, that, the, an inducement case is the last resort. I'll just look for any other way. Uh, at least before Global Tech, you had the DSU case, knew or should have known. Believe me, as a trial lawyer, you highlighted, underlined, and blew up the word should have to try to get something that sounded a little more negligence. And with Global Tech closing that door, uh, the fact that, that uh, for a brief period of time the Federal Circuit said a belief of invalidity also comes in, I don't think changes things. What I do think is going to be interesting, though, is with Global Tech, a case for inducement sure sounds a lot like willfulness. And so I think to the extent that you have an inducement case, you're probably going to be pretty close to satisfying a willful case. But And if you file the willfulness case, of course, the defendant does get to bring in their thoughts about invalidity. So does it change the trial? At the end of the day, I don't think so. I think it does get complicated. Um, but to get to your question, no. I, I'm not out there hanging the shingle saying, anybody got an inducement case? We're, <laughs> So let me sure. amplify that a little bit, because the infringement statute, the direct infringement statute, sets out three logically connected actions that can give rise to infringement liability, right? Making the manufacturer upstream, selling the retailer in between, and the user is the consumer at the end. So anybody who's upstream from you can be liable both as a direct infringer for having done that piece of the, of the chain, and then also be liable for inducing the people that came after. So as in this case, Cisco's uh, uh, sued not only for induced infringement, but also for direct infringement. I think that remains uh, very viable. And uh, I think you know, it's, it's uh, not at all surprising that Mark would 
prefer to go after them for, for direct infringement first, followed by inducement only. So with apologies to some of my friends in the room, I'm going to use the T word. <laughs> so uh, Justice Scalia, in his dissent, says that the court's holding increases the interim, interim, interim power of patent trolls. Um, is, is this seen uh, or perceived to be a, a boon for, for non-practicing entities? And I'll start with the professor for today. I'll let Marty go. <laughs> you, sir. So, I think this brings us nicely back a full circle because if you think back to the eBay case, it was Justice Kennedy that was concerned about this whole idea of patent trolls uh, even before the term became fashionable. And here, what's interesting is both Justice Kennedy in the majority and Justice Scalia in the dissent go out of their way to talk about the possible implications with uh, Comil on uh, vexatious litigation by patent trolls. And I think they re realize that there's a real possibility that if, if the standard is lowered for our patentees, we can be sure that those with the incentives to monetize the patents and without the disincentives that come with uh, being countersued for infringement, they would take that to the bank with them. Uh, Justice Kalia quoted how with a uh, smartphone with 250,000 patents, with semiconductor chips, 430,000, so I think the possibility of it is real. Uh, and he also talks about, well, uh, the majority talks about Rule 11 being sufficient to address this problem. Well, if, if you look again at the facts, the fact that we have in Congress consideration of S 1137, the fact that we're considering the Innovation Act, the fact that 27 states has enacted state legislation against patent trolls suggests that this is not a problem that can be just fixed with one policy lever. Uh, and I think Comil has added to the arsenal of the patent trolls. So I think that at the margin, it's actually not going to do very much uh, to embolden non-practicing entities. And that's because in the grand scheme of things, if you look back through the cases that we've seen, um, eBay, obviously, in 2006. More recently, on the remedies front, we've had uh, Octane Fitness and Highmark limiting the ability um, to, uh, or altering, I should say, the ability to get uh, fee shifting in cases where the, ca the claim turns out to have been frivolous or uh, at least not in good faith. All these things, and then that's before we get to the, the tetralogy of, of Section 101 cases where the patent is simply going to be knocked out as outside the purview of the patent system altogether. I think all of these cases cut pretty squarely against patent owners, be they practicing entities or non-practicing entities. And it's really the PTAB and the inter partes review system where the finely grained sorting of, you know, is it a, a trollable patent? Is it a patent that lends itself to over-assertion because there's something wrong with the legal quality of it, or is it a perfectly valid patent that's being asserted in an overbroad way? And that's really more the purview of Rule 11, right? Those two sets of cases are rarely distinguished in the policy debate, let alone in the sort of narrow confines of, of the case or controversy in court. So I think all of these very broad, uh, broad brush cases that the Supreme Court's been coming down with cut pretty squarely against, and if, uh, if at the margin, an inducer is uh, somewhat differently able to, to defend itself after a commel. I don't think that's going to make very much difference in the broader debate. On well, you know, when you say troll, I guess you need a working definition. If by troll you mean non-practicing entity, that would include companies like Cisco, who actually file suits on patents they don't practice. It includes Sony. It includes uh, Apple. I mean, there's a lot of companies who own patent portfolios who file lawsuits to monetize their assets even though they don't practice it. So if you use that, it's one thing. But I don't think that's what people mean when they say troll. Usually it's more of a, and I love this, over-asserting. It's these, and it connotes this concept of frivolous, uh, and where I'm going to give you a letter, and if you don't pay some money, I'm going to sue you, and you're going to have to spend it. If that is the connotation, and I'm going to use that for answering your question, we, we understood that, and we 
told the court, look, the, the fix for that is not the burden of having to show that the defendant knew the patent was valid. The fix for that is addressing exactly what it is, over-assertion. If the patent is invalid, go to the PTAP, file your IPO. If the, if the person sending the letter didn't do his claim charts, uh, let me just put in a point here, practice point. In my office and every lawyer I know that does plaintiff works, and I do about 50-50, before I file the complaint, I've got a claim chart. I could give my intent, con, infringement contentions with the pictures and literature from the defendant that's publicly accessible the day I file the complaint. And I would say if you're a plaintiff filing a, a plaintiff's case and you haven't done that, you haven't done your homework. So our, our argument to the court was, wait, the place to deal with that is through Rule 11, going to the PTAP, or 285. I think you have to take the problem of the over-assertion and what they did in Octane. Because if I were the defendant, and I know one of your cheat sheets, you know, one of the, one of the questions is, well, what do defendants do now? Press, press the plaintiff. Hey, show me your claim charts. Show me what you got. And when that defend, plaintiff hasn't done it pre-suit, or they do it and it's just, it's poor. I mean, how can you sue 50 different companies on 50 different products and the claim chart looks exactly the same for all 50? I mean, if you've practiced, you've seen that. You say, no, that's not a claim chart. Tell me where my product does this. My point is, the problems that are described are valid over assertion, and it, and it hurts everyone, the defendants, the plaintiff's bar who want a good system, the quality of patents. But I, we, in our case, specifically said, court, the place to deal with that problem is not in the burden of proof. The place to deal with it is procedural. I, I will note that I've read, it, I've read this subject to correction by the academics in the room, but this is the first time that the phrase patent troll has appeared in a published Supreme Court. So well, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we, we, we have about 10 minutes left. Uh, I know that the, the audience is probably teeming with questions for this panel, so I'll throw it out to you guys. So what struck me when I wrote this, read this opinion, wrote this opinion, uh, <laughs> when I read this opinion was not whether it was right or wrong, but how simplistic the analysis was. And we've heard kind of two ideas of what infringement is. Infringement is uh, uh, do you practice every element of the, of the claim? Or infringement is are you essentially liable for infringement? And the Supreme Court, I mean, that's essentially a question of statutory interpretation. Mm -hmm. What does infringement mean within the uh, 271B? But the Supreme Court doesn't really engage in the normal tools of statutory construction, uh, statutory interpretation in its, in its opinion. And I actually, after I read the opinion, went through, and actually the, in various pl places, infringement is used in the statute to mean both liability and it's meant to uh, mean just practicing each element. It's not unusual that we don't see normal statutory interpretation patent cases like our patentable subject matter ones, but this just seemed more amenable to, to, to it to me. And I'm wondering if in the briefing there were more of the traditional kind of uh, 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 tools of statutory interpretation, looking at other parts of the statute, uh, looking at legislative intent, all of that kind of stuff in the briefing. So we'll kick it off, I guess. Um, I, I think that's right, and I, I was somewhat surprised to see given Justice Scalia's position, I mean, it tracked a very statutory interpretation-based argument. Um, and the, the, the sort of outcome he arrived at is perfectly consistent with a, a uh, construction of not only 271B, but also 271A. It's worth noting that both opinions, the majority and the dissent, did talk about the structure of the patent statute, reading things sort of in party material with each other, and what implications that has. But it was only at a very high level of generality. Um, I was surprised that, uh, that we didn't see that. Now, it's to your first point, which is that the opinion and its analysis were, in parts, um, simplifying a lot of things. I think that's right. And I was particularly struck by the majority's use of tortious interference with contract and trespass as examples uh, of apt analogies to what's going on here, because trespass is the canonical case. If you go back to sort of Hornbook tort law, it, yeah, you don't need to know that the person owned the land, you don't need to know that you were committing trespass, but you do need to know that you were stepping on the land, and that's what makes it an intentional tort. 
It's not strict liability in that sense. Same thing with direct infringement, but they just glossed over that part. So I think Greg touched a very interesting point. I think you, you made the comment on IP uh, props as well, and it really sparked up a, a very interesting debate. Uh, one of the comments was, so if 271B, is it a, a common law aspect that's been codified in the Patent Act? And I think if you look at the legislative history of 271B, the answer is yes. Justice Scalia, in fact, made that point that 271B is a codification of the aiding and abetting uh, common law, uh, which I think, as uh, Saurabh rightly said, has its roots in, in tort law. Now, the question then is, if it's a common law uh, statutory hybrid, how should the court treat it? Well, clearly, you have widely differing opinions, uh, as you have seen both at the federal circuit level as well as the Supreme Court. And I think what you will, you will go, face going forward is a high panel dependency. Mm -hmm. So again, rounding back to what I said at the start, if you go back to the federal circuit and you appear before Judge O'Malley and Chief Judge Prost, you probably would want to couch your arguments as a plaintiff a little bit more carefully because they're not going to just take the mandate from heaven from the Supreme Court and say, well, yes, this is what uh, we should follow. And they're going to find their way to distinguish it on the facts and so on. If you appear before Judge Newman, uh, well, then you'd probably be in a better position. So 271B is one of those statutes which I think gives courts a significant amount of discretion. And it's something I think that attorneys will want to think about. Just, I think, I, I, I was, well, one, I can tell you, and this might be the difference between an, an observer and a or litigant. I just, look, we won, we <laughs> lost. That, that's as simple as I know. But your, your point is taken, but I think it illustrates not just in this case, but the other patent cases that come out of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court doesn't have the background and technical analysis experience that the Federal Circuit does. And I think the one thing the Federal Circuit, the Supreme Court has told us, at least these last two terms, we don't like the idea of special jurisprudence. We want terms and concepts in the general area to match up with what you're doing in the patent. The examples we gave the court of, of the belief that a law of criminal statutes is valid, uh, tortious interference. And we, we specifically said, look at these other areas because we think that's what the Supreme Court wants to do. To get to your point, I think it's, it's very interesting now to take what you described about um, the analysis and then what the Federal Circuit just did last month in the Limelight Acoma case, you know, because now, I think earlier was a question about, well, what about these inducement cases? So you're taking them? No, I'm trying to figure out a way to make what was an inducement case now fit the new Akamai model of two-party direct infringement. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you want more of that analysis of statutory interpretation, I think you're going to have to go to the Federal Circuit. You're just not going to see it. Well, gentlemen, thank you for your time today. In the interest of keeping our, our program on track, I'm going to cut off any further questions, I'll, although I know the audience is, is brimming with it. <laughs> I'm sure these gentlemen will stick around if you guys have any questions uh, later this morning or this afternoon. But thank you all for your attention this morning. Okay. Thank you.